Well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to lecture for chapter two of BU 261. I uh, hope you guys are having a great day and you're staying safe and you are uh, taking some time to be thankful for God's blessings upon you and your family. I certainly have to do that every day. Um, and uh, so I hope that you are able to take a moment and do that. So uh, that being said, um, let's for a moment look at discovery <clears throat> and look at chapter two and what we're gonna be doing this week. <clears throat> so as you can see, I've been updating um, discovery week by week. Um, if you would, just keep that in mind. Um, you don't necessarily need to race ahead. Um, and I think there'll be enough material uh, week to week for you to be able to kind of uh, uh, fill your plate with what you'll need uh, for this class. Um, so if we look at uh, what we're gonna be doing this week, I've, I've hidden this algebra uh, material only because um, gonna not really focus on that this, uh, this semester. Um, what I'd like for you to do is focus on uh, looking at the lecture notes, which I've uploaded, and then I've got a practice exercise in advance of our first lab, which will be next week, not this week, but next week. Um, and so if you would, uh, look at those exercises, work through them, uh, try to do them uh, without necessarily uh, doing a bunch of Google searches and YouTube searches. Certainly you can, um, but I really want you to start to kind of absorb it and even struggle a little bit with it um, so that when we have our first lab next week, then uh, at least you'll kind of uh, started to immerse yourself in the process of looking at a data set trying to understand it, and then trying to make some uh, conclusions about that data and, and, and turn it into information that we could uh, present to managers. So, and then this algebra review, um, don't worry about that one right now. We'll uh, worry about that a little bit later. Um, and with that, let's go to our lecture for chapter two. All right, hopefully this is all going to work. We all are sort of dependent on technology and this new world we're living in. So, um, so in chapter two, uh, this chapter in the textbook is uh, statistical presentations and graphical displays. Um, one of the things that you, you'll want to appreciate in this chapter is that um, I, I like to say that data is kind of the language of business. Um, but one of the things I had to learn in my 30 years in industry is that data is really not good enough. There's plenty of data out there. But what we really need is to take that data and then understand it and turn it into information. Um, you can think about, for example, if uh, you go to the to your doctor for an annual kind of physical or checkup um, He or she might run some tests just to kind of make sure everything's working. Okay, and then they'll often have a report or reports that are created uh, Based upon some of the tests that they they ran or maybe blood that was drawn and what you typically Find if you've been through that process is that your doctor he or she doesn't necessarily send the reports to you and just here's a bunch of data hope you can figure it out um, they usually sit down with you and walk you through what do the numbers mean here are some areas that are you're doing really well here are some areas that you might want to work on and then here maybe a little bit of improvement right um, and so that's what we're trying to do 
uh, with this chapter and want you to learn is that we're going to take business data and we're going to turn it into information through graphs and charts and put it in a presentable form so that uh, managers and executives um, can make decisions, educated decisions based on that data. So um, I'm going to move my little screen here. Um, so one of the first things we want to appreciate is that um, there is uh, often in data this idea of a frequency distribution. Um, and here, for example, you can, can see this table. And imagine you are an HR manager for a company. And let's say you have 100 employees that are working at the company and, and your job as an HR manager is to sort of watch over them and understand them, uh, uh, what their strengths and how, how much money they make and, and so on and so on. And so here you can see this is a frequency distribution that helps us understand out of our 100 employees, how many of them are making a certain amount within particular ranges. So for example, we can see here that in this fictitious company, we've got seven workers that are making between 240 and $259 a week. Um, but most of our employees, you can see, uh, when I say most of them, out of these five, or excuse me, these six buckets uh, of, of wage ranges, that the greatest number of workers is in this range of 280 to 299. There are 33 workers, or about, of course, uh, a third of your total workforce is in that range. And so you can see, for example, that putting uh, each one of the 100 workers looking at the dimension of wages in each one of these buckets can be very helpful to try to figure out, um, well, you know, maybe out of, let's say, these 33, um, maybe 13 of them have been with the company a very long time and maybe they've performed well. And so maybe they need to move uh, from 280 to 299 up to 300 to 319, okay? So then uh, if we move 13 up from 280 to 300, then that 33 becomes 20, and then that 25 becomes 38. I was hoping I could do math in my head pretty quick. Uh, so you can see that's how we could use a table like this. Um, th this is a fancy word, uh, histogram, but basically it's looking at each one of these ranges, um, how many employees are in each range. Um, it's really saying the same thing. The histogram is saying the same thing as that table. It's just presented in a visual way. Um, now, one thing that's kind of interesting that you'll want to appreciate is the shape of this histogram. And it kind of starts off low, and then it peaks here in the middle, and then it, it, it slopes down and to the right. And so this is beginning to look a little bit like what we would call a bell curve. And some of you may have heard of a bell curve or a normal distribution curve. Um, and so we'll be talking a lot more about that. But it's interesting that when we look at this data that we're starting to see that kind of normal distribution emerge. Um, there are different kinds of frequency curves. Um, and so just to kind of mention a, a, a few of those, this one in particular, uh, here under symmetrical distributions, this one here is kind of like we were talking about on the last slide. It's, it's a symmetrical uh, distribution. You could uh, take this distribution and bisect it, meaning you could draw a line in between 
uh, right in the middle and you'd have an equal amount of the curve on the right hand side of that line and then equal amount on the left hand side okay um, and that is important uh, because that when we see a distribution that is symmetrical like that then we can make some uh, important statements about uh, the entire population uh, of, of uh, that particular distribution. Um, and that'll become more clear as, as we move forward. Um, another thing that we might uh, talk about, or we will talk about, is this idea of a tail. Um, and so we've kind of got this idea of looking at uh, this curve, for example, we've got sort of a tail over here on the left and a tail over here on the right. <clears throat> and those tails are important because they help us understand um, what is the probability or the likelihood of a particular event or a situation. Um, is it likely or not? And we're, we're going to begin to uh, understand that when we divide this distribution into two, um, we would call that an average, or in statistics, we would call that a mean, M-E-A-N. So we'll use the word average or mean interchangeably. Also, what we can see here is that not all distributions are uh, symmetrical. You can see here in the lower, these skewed distributions, that sometimes distributions uh, kind of skew to the right or skew to the left. Um, and, and, and that's kind of the world that we live in. Um, uh, <clears throat> in a theoretical sense, we want every distribution to be symmetrical, but often they're not. And uh, we won't spend a lot of time in this class talking about skewed distributions, but just understand that while we really prefer this symmetrical normal distribution, often in the real world, you would have a, distributions that, a distribution that's a positive or a negative skew. Um, another uh, kind of fancy word that we use in distributions is this idea of kurtosis. And kurtosis is basically what is the the shape of that curve, does it have kind of a, a steep peak or not? Um, you know, uh, on this prior slide, what we were looking at is more around is the distribution skewed to the right or to the left? Um, in kurtosis, what we're looking for is, is there a particular peak? And so here are three examples of uh, curves that would exhibit some kind of kurtosis. Again, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about um, these types of uh, these curves, but you can see that here um, we've got this kind of kurtosis, which is basically flat. We've got this type, which is, looks pretty much like a normal distribution. And then we've got this one that obviously has quite a peak at the top. Um, so again, just uh, from a, a, a quick flyby, this is another element of distributions that we want to have in our vocabulary. Another way that we can look at distributions is this idea of cumulative, okay? And so if we look at this table, if we look at um, basically this first or this leftmost column, and then this number of workers column, we can see that that was basically the table um, that we had uh, in the prior slide. Now, what we can do is we can um, take each one of these uh, numbers in each one of these weekly ranges and we can add them up. And so that helps us understand um, how much of the total distribution is made up by each one of these segments. Um, so if we look at this shape here, what we can see is that 
there isn't a whole lot of area under the curve here in the beginning. That's these upper, or excuse me, these first uh, wage wage ranges. But then there's quite a bit more as we move forward, uh, or, or excuse me, move higher in wage ranges. And then there's not a whole lot of the entire um, distribution up at this upper limit. So what we would kind of see here is that this would be sort of a cumulative um, uh, distribution curve that would help us understand kind of where is the variance coming from, where does most of the area under the curve lie within uh, this particular uh, frequency table. Uh, you may remember those of you that have had um, uh, some advanced calculus, uh, this idea of integration and measuring the amount of area under a curve. We're not gonna do any calculus in this class, just to be clear. Um, but we, we can start to kind of imagine that, uh, that the idea of uh, integration and calculus might help us at least be another way to think about this distribution curve, this cumulative distribution curve. Um, uh, one of the things that we want to be able to also appreciate is that we want to look at the total number of observations uh, within an entire data set and see which uh, percentage of those observations by range are occurring. Um, an observation is kind of, a, again, sort of a fancy word for, there are seven observations, meaning seven workers that are in this category of 240 to 259. Okay, so an observation, a person, we're kind of genericizing it a little bit in, in talking about um, the number of workers as um, observations, but uh, you know, in this case, they are in fact workers. This may be um, a chart that you may have seen before or may have heard of before, um, as this idea of a Pareto chart. Um, and if you've ever worked in maybe quality control, um, if you've ever worked in trying to understand root cause of a particular, let's say a failure in a, in a quality situation, then you may have heard about this idea of Pareto charts. Um, and basically what we're looking at as a Pareto chart is we're trying to understand what is the particular element or factor in this entire distribution that tends to be um, kind of dominate this, this uh, distribution. So here is an example we can see. Um, imagine again, if you are an HR manager for those 100 employees, and let's say that um, you as an HR manager are starting to see more and more workers show up late. Uh, for their, uh, to, to clock in for their shift, let's say. And so we might, as an HR manager, we might say, you know, <laughs> I really want to understand this. Um, you know, uh, all of my workers, and most of them are really pretty good, hard workers. Um, so it's a little strange that people are starting to show up late because they haven't in the past, let's say. And so in this Pareto chart, if we did such an analysis, what we might see is that most of the, in fact, here we can see on the right axis, we can see uh, the, the percentage of total distribution here on the right. Um, and so what we would see looking, looking at this is that this first category is traffic. And at least based upon our analysis, we would say that about 35% of the reason why employees are late is because of traffic. Okay, uh, hard to know if that is reasonable, if it's not reasonable. I'm trying to imagine, for example, if 
uh, you were in Atlanta or Los Angeles and uh, the Summer Olympics were happening in your city, wow, you could imagine the traffic would be a lot more intense and therefore you could see traffic being a big reason why people might be late. Um, a second one here is uh, childcare. And so that takes up, or excuse me, is responsible for about, you know, I don't know, 20, 28% of the total uh, late arrivals. But what's interesting about this Pareto chart is that if we add traffic and child care together, what we would see is that particular dot here. We would say that 60% of the reason why employees are showing up late has something to do with either traffic or child care. Um, and those of you that are working parents, you can certainly relate to that. Um, you can see there's some other elements. Uh, maybe if you're again in a big city like Atlanta or Los Angeles, um, you might often have to take public transportation. And so depending upon whether uh, the subway or the light rail in your city is working well or on time or not, that could have an impact on uh, whether you're gonna show up on, on time or not. It's interesting here too, that um, if we add up traffic, childcare, and public transportation, those add up to just about 80% of the total um, late arrivals, uh, the causes. And so some of you may have heard, if you haven't heard of Pareto charts, you might have heard of the 80-20 rule. And it's really interesting, I found in industry, that believe it or not, that 80-20 rule, it holds pretty well, which is, I think, in my opinion, that's sort of another evidence of God. I don't know how he architected the universe, but it's pretty interesting that that 80-20 rule tends to be pretty, pretty spot on. And so uh, if you're curious about that, uh, go on YouTube or go on, um, on the internet, and I'm sure there are lots of examples that uh, you could see that would help continue to validate that. Um, here is a, a, a YouTube video on charting in, uh, in Excel, and um, of course there are lots of videos on charting, uh, but and I won't take the time here to show you this video, but just know that uh, there are many videos and then I would encourage you to look at this video and that will give you kind of another um, uh, perspective or resource as you uh, kind of wade into this uh, tool of Microsoft Excel and how to again make data turn data into information. So with that I hope you have a great day and I will see you soon. Bye-bye.